So welcome everyone today uh, for a very special seminar by our colleague from the Computer Science Department, Professor Klaus Müller, who is a professor uh, in Computer Sciences Department here at Stony Brook. And, uh, and I think some of us, or maybe all of us know that Stony Brook uh, has a campus uh, in Seoul, South Korea, and Professor Müller is the chairman of the Computer Science Department there, and actually at this time, he presents most of his time on in that campus, uh, where they have a graduate program, and now recently they have also introduced an undergrad program in computer sciences in Seoul. And uh, so this is a, a great facility from uh, which, actually in which uh, Klaus was telling me that there are graduate students from many countries in Asia uh, have come and enrolled. And so uh, Klaus uh, Mueller did his undergraduate studies in electrical engineering <coughs> at the Polytech Polytechnic University of Ulm in Germany. And then he did his master's in biomedical engineering and also in computer science at Ohio State University where he also did his PhD in computer sciences. And he, he has diverse interests in computer engineering and so he is, he also holds adjunct professor positions in Stony Brook's uh, Department of Biomedical Engineering and also in Radiology. And in recognition of his accomplishment, he received the SUNY Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Scholarship uh, in 2011. So we all know that in, in atmospheric sciences, both in weather research and, and in climate, we are inundated with huge amounts of data. And, um, and so the techniques that uh, many computer scientists have developed in, in visualization and graphics uh, can be very useful to us. And I imagine that is what Dr. Mueller is going to tell us about. So let us welcome Klaus Wink. Thanks a lot for your kind introduction. Okay. Actually, I started in the, I started at uh, Stonebrook in 1999, and, uh, so then I moved to Sunni Korea for a while because actually it's quite interesting to see how it works over there. Um, so today I talk, want to talk a little bit about you know my work on uh, uh, high-dimensional data analysis and, and visualization. I'm more a visualization guy, so I try to do things more in a visual sense. Okay, so so. Yeah. So here, this world big data probably everyone has very, very much uh, been uh, familiar with. There's like you know Facebook and, and our uh, the Internet of Things, all kinds of things produce massive amounts of data. Also, atmospheric sciences, of course, no, it's not an exception. And um, what usually people think about when they think visualization, you know, they think of pie charts and bar charts and things like this. Or of line graphs. If you have one D, when you have a one D signal, you know you can just plot the data like there's X and Y. It's very simple. If you have a two D, if you have two D data, you will make an image. That's like sort of radiology, or you can make a little height field. It's actually not really three D. It just looks three D. If you have three D data, then you have to make like stacks of things. Okay, you know it's also not. You know you can do volume rendering and look at it in three dimensions. Still, okay, you know, we still understand what 3D is. Once you have 4D, though, then it becomes time. Then you have to, like, animate these things, right? But, you know, that's still okay if you remember what the frame from 10 frame from 10 minutes ago was. And so it only gets challenging. But once you have, like, lots of data, right? Like, for example, like a car data set, okay? Like you say, cars at miles per gallon, top speed, acceleration, <coughs> so on and so on. These are many variables. And, and if you want to, and if you want to, if you're in the business of, Shopping for a car, if you're of a car manufacturer who wants to see which car they should market and which one they should not market, you want to look at these interactions. You know, you want to see like how are the number of cylinders and the weight and year and country origin related somehow, right? You want to look at all of this at once. You can't just plot one graph and another graph and another graph or make a pie chart or a bar chart. You get a run out of uh, visual, visual primitives here. Or you can look at it in a spreadsheet. Okay, so you know, I mean. We'd like to find anything here. It's very difficult to do, especially when you know there's only a limited screen size. So there is one very standard technique in high-dimensional data visualization that's been out there since the 90s, 
which is called parallel coldness. So I don't know if you know the method of parallel coldness or not, but I'll explain it to you. So this is again this car. As a good German, I like cars. So, <laughs> so here, well, I'm actually, <laughs> so here, here's one a single car represented as something called polyline. Okay, so here's the mile per gallon cylinders, horsepower, weight, uh, acceleration, year, and origin. This is really this acceleration is really uh, one over. Okay, and uh, so this car is low mile per gallon. Small, small number of cylinders, low horsepower, high, decent weight, high acceleration, or low, and then year and origin. So this one car, it's fine. You can, it's like a line chart. One car is good, but now think about you have many cars, right? All of a sudden, it's hard to see even an individual car. Of course, you can highlight it. You know, you can go somewhere and highlight and make it, make it red. But it's hard to see anything in clusters of things going. You can can really figure out what is really going on. So you can do one thing. You can do like a clustering algorithm already, like k-means or something more advanced. Now you can see some groups of cars, but most people, you know, you can put the mean there, so it looks a little more, you know, intuitive. But most people sort of, I don't know about you, but most people are somewhat discouraged by this sort of wild a set of a, a set of lines, right? They want to see something more like that looks more like Excel, a little more like abstracted. So we came up with something like this, which is called illustrative abstraction techniques for parallel coldness. So here's a bunch of here's a bunch of uh, a car, uh, like this is a different data set from this, from a marketing campaign. It doesn't really matter. So here's a bunch of bunch of uh, salespeople that have uh, you know that are characterized by certain things that generate in a marketing campaign. Okay, here are these these lines again, and SAP who I worked with on this. They were always scaled by this. So we did like this, we abstracted it. And all of a sudden they liked it much more. Because now it sort of shows you a little bit the, 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 you know, the variation in certain variables. And still it, it gives you like it gives a way to gives you a way to see the trends. It looks more appealing to more general business user in this case. Okay. And then we did something, we, we thought, okay. But we still want to see a little bit of dynamics of the of the spread of the data. So we what we did was that did a little bit of computer graphics, basically texturized this 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 the shape here a little bit with the with the dynamics of the of the spread of the data inside. So you can still see a little bit. There was really not a lot of things in the lower range, and here was a little bit less populated here. So it's like a little bit of a graphical trick to to, to achieve this kind of thing. And then if you look at three different sales uh, teams, you can sort of see how they. How they, uh, uh, you know, how they relate to each one another. You know, some sales teams have low number of leads, but but they don't, but, but they generate a lot of opportunities. And then you want to know why that is. You know, you can like look at this stuff. You can reorder it if you like. You know, it's beyond the point now. But this, I'll, I'll show you a little bit of a demo on this, on this, on this parallel coordinates. The power really is here that you can interact and you can sort of play around with the data until you know what you're looking for until you see that. This is not just, you're not supposed to just look at this and quickly see something, okay? You're supposed to go take take this uh, cost per one lead axis, for example, and put it here. And once you do this here, when you put the cost per one lead, you find out why this, why this red sales team is so successful, because they spend a lot of money on, on, the, on the lead they generate. That's actually a secret in this, okay? But you're supposed to play around and start calling things a little bit. So I'll show you like a little video that, that shows you like this kind of interaction you can do with this kind of tool. This has no sound, so. So this is like your, your wild array of, 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 of lines, and then you can start counting things. So you can start segmenting the data. So let's say you want to have see only the lower ranges of a certain variable, then you can just bring it down and ex exclude all the other point data points that have this. You can start seeing clusters. You can start painting them, if you like, and see the other cluster go on. Now you see green and red. Then you can make them abstract, abstract so you can see a little more the overall shapes of things. Then you can abstract them to the right density. So it's basically both, of the, it's like the good things of both worlds. You see a little bit of the population, at the same time it's not as scary as individual lines. That's what we thought we think was not bad. And SAP actually liked it, so I'm gonna stop here now. Get to this later. So as you can see, like there was interaction, right? People could like start culling things, they could like start excluding some data points and identify individual clusters, all in high dimensions. So you can really, there's no boundary, you can have more dimensions if you like. 
stuff. So another technique to show data, data oftentimes the scatter plot. You know, the scatter plot is like here, there's like a two-dimensional data set. This is like one variable and another one, and then you can plot the points according to the values they have. You can see certain shapes, like you can see here there's a cluster here, some outliers here. It all works all fine for like when you have a two-dimensional relationship, but when you say, once you have like like four-dimensional, what is this, four-dimensional, it becomes hard to see multivariate relationships. But right? if you want to see like variable one, two, and three, or four, how they interact with one another, you'll have to go all around the, 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 the scatter plot, the matrix, actually. And then it becomes even more, becomes even bigger, right? So you find yourself looking around a lot, you know, like, what is going on? <laughs> it's just very unwieldy to interact with such a, with such a scatter plot matrix. But it's something that's heavily used in even the visualization community. You can see this a lot. People put these things up, and there's, there's just limits to this. OK, so we came up with something to, that allows you high dimension to navigate high dimensional space a little easier. And we were very sort of you know, inspired by TripAdvisor. Because TripAdvisor lets you go and plan your trip, find out what you should see on your trip when you go on a vacation or some sightseeing tour. So why not look at high dimensional space the same way? Right? There's also interesting sites, projections, subspaces you want to see. And you can look at them one by one and have the machine analyze them for you, to present them to you, and then you can mark the ones that you like and explore them a little locally, right? So this is basically what we did. So when you look at this thing here, when you look at the, like a typical task of, 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 of sightseeing in Paris here, you, know, you would like have a map of all the different sites, then you, could, then you mark the ones that you want to see, you plan a trip to the sites, and then you go on a trip, right? You take the bus, go from one site to the next, you know, get off the bus, and look around a little bit, and explore the neighborhood, then find out where, you, where the bus stop is, get the little map and figure out where the bus stop is, and you go on the next, on the, to the next site. And exactly the same paradigm, which is very intuitive, I mean, everyone has done this, you can just do the high dimensional space exactly the same way, so it's not gonna be as pretty as a map, but, but, you know, but, but, so basically what you would do is you would, you would find, you would try to find out some data configurations that, that fit best the personal preference, like something your own research goal, in this case, you are interested in to, to uh, examine more. And there is always some sort of data partitioning that, that, will, that, that you require to sort of see certain trends, right? There's all this massive amount of data, and there's often a lot of noise involved, and so, you know, how to really see where are really your subpopulations, right? where's your subspaces, so, you know, so you can, but you want to find that out. And do, because of the noise, it's oftentimes difficult to do this automatically, okay? So initial sites would be basically things like that you found that the aut automated algorithm found that you trust, like PCA analysis or projection pursuit, stuff like this. Find some key projections, some key subspaces on the data that you can then you know, explore more locally. The same thing with key clusterings, where you can find any, any of your type of algorithms and, 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 and find some key, key, key clusterings that are sort of like some trying to identify certain subpopulations, at least when they're easy. But now it's up to you to go on the tour and then refine those, those outcomes, right? To really bring in what you know about the data and then maybe refine what, what, the, what the standard algorithm did and tune it more to what you actually, what you expect it to be. And you can also learn about outliers in this, on this, on this, on this, uh, in this activity and so on, right? You can also tune parameters of these algorithms. All these algorithms usually have parameters, right? K means has number of K, affinity clustering has certain things. He said all have parameters in which you have to tune. So here you can tune them while you're examining the data. Okay? So interaction is really the key. So here's, here's this little you know, user interface that we wrote. So what these, what these icons are, they are, are um, what they are, they're like clusterings, the projections of the data, of, of subspaces of the data. Like if you look at the n-dimensional cube, hypercube, right, there's usually certain subpopulations that call that are like hyperdimensional subcubes that you can that you can extract and look at in, in isolation, right? So this is each of these is like a sort of one of the subpopulations that you can look at. And and you group them by similarity in the terms of the projection, in terms of the of the, the in terms of the location of the subcube in the high dimensional space. So like when they're here closer by, they usually are very similar in terms of their in terms of their orientation and viewing particles. Right? You can see this is like the the 
this is on the axis dimension, the, the, the weight of the individual dimension axis, they're very similar here, but they're very different here, okay? So then you can go and say, okay, I'm gonna look at these in, in turn, right? I'm gonna connect those key clusterings and look at them in some ways, and then um, bring them into another tool that we have, which is called the uh, Site Explorer. You know, so this is like this is actually a projective algorithm where you can go and create some what you probably know bind plots of data, right? But they're interactive bind plots, so not just standing bind plots, they're interactive. Okay. So here like this is like the points, and these are the dimensions that you had, like the attributes that you had, and this is the projection of the attribute axis into this particular view. But you have to think of it like this, there's like there's to show it to you like this. There's, there's, there's like a, there's, all, there's always two orthogonal vectors in which you project all your data points into, and those vectors are n-dimensional vectors, really, right? They have like certain attributes, certain weights, and you can move them freely around, and to basically to perform a dot product of all the of all the points into this basis, okay? And then you create this sort of plot, and you can also project all the data dimensions into it too. So now you can see like there are some points that have a widespread in this along this data dimension, some other points here. But, but what, when you, any the statistics books you will read about biplots, they will tell you that these things can, mis, can mislead you. Because sometimes there's certain neighbors that are really not neighbors at all. They just happen to be neighbors because of this particular combination of, of dimensions, right? They must not be neighbors, okay? So biplots have a really big sort of ability to lie to you, right? They could be, it's just because this is a, because when you have n-dimensional variations, Projecting them into 2D, there's always going to be some loss of availability. You lose that, and there could be just some, you know, could be some some mis 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 mischievous combinations that just end up to be in the same place. I have some examples for this. I, you know, too far. Like this point, I think one of those points. And they're actually close neighbors, but they actually should be on opposite sides. You can every statistics book will tell you this. These balls should at least tell you this. I biplots can somewhat lie to you. So what happens here? We have this, what we call this touchpad polygon, which basically is just a mouse, you know, the 2D polygon that you use to control your screen, uh, your mouse on the, on the screen. We extend it to n dimensions. So what you see here are these different dimension vectors. So here this is like different uh, attributes of, college, of a college data set, safety and uh, local atmosphere, campus and so on. And this two, there's a red and a blue dot here, and you can move those dots around. And what happens then if you move this dot really close to one dimension here, then basically what, what the x-axis of your projection vector will be more aligned with this dimension and the y, if you move the y dot somewhere here, then the y dimension will be more associated with this particular dimension. Or you can move them all somewhat general place and then there'll be more a combination of certain attributes. This way you can generate these very, very uh, uh, generalized views, okay. so. I'll show you a video to show you how this actually works. I think the best thing is this video. This one has sound. So I hope it works. I can't even get my mouse to work. If the sound doesn't work. So somehow the sun doesn't work with this one. Okay, I'll allow the sound myself. Do you think this is there something wrong? Does, does it, it looks like it's me. Huh? That. Is my my screen? Yeah, oh my god, it's, it's me. <laughs> I'm abusing you guys, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, it's just the red so much. Now we're gonna try that in a relative position to all other sites. Showing how the view is changing. So this basically what you see here is a is a particular projection of, of and here you control it by these by this by these two axes by axis points, right? So as you move around with this point here, you're gonna start moving the view of the high dimensional space slightly tilt them in different directions, right? So now as you move a little further up, you in, you increase the influence of certain attributes and decrease the influence of other attributes. And this makes basically the, the point cloud move. Okay, so it's essentially motion parallax that you are really using here to look actually and get an n-dimensional n-dimensional view. You know, you can actually see n-dimensions because you can see, you can disambiguate certain certain 
certain overlaps by just moving the point cloud a little bit over. And some things that are long distance will move faster than others. You know, so you actually can get you can see shapes quite easily with this. By using the right control points and the touch pads. You can see some clusters move around, but only very that these are multi-very clusters. To show the axis coordinates onto the scatter plot directly. User also can choose to show the motion trail to follow the trajectory of each data point. Notice there are several clusters that are moving together with the same direction and trend. We brush clusters that we discovered by navigating through. Follow the motion trail to confirm the brush clusters. We notice that there are two additional clusters in a green one by following the trail. Brushing again. Bugging around the clusters in the local neighborhood. Note that the touch pad is configured in a subspace with seven dimensions. We can see where we are currently traveling in the global map. The red node is the current view. Hopping to another destination site just by clicking a node. Touchpad interface is... Okay, so you should get the idea. So basically you can go and, and just do this local exploration, just go on one of those icons and move around and, and then maybe see some clusters all of a sudden that may have come apart. That may, the clustering algorithm may not have identified the difference, but uh, you can see it and you can also by looking at the dimensions how they project, you can you can you can set your own priorities. You can say, I really want to see this particular dimension more, give more influence and less than another one. So now, so we also actually use the trackball. I guess maybe you guys know for what the trackball is, right? It's like this kind of game interface where you can go and just rotate a ball with a mouse. So this ball will move around. And there's certain interactions we provide that let you allow you to skip from one high-dimensional trackball space to another high-dimensional trackball space by certain mouse interactions. So it's also quite interesting. So now you don't have a touchpad anymore. You can just go and uh, manipulate directly into the visualization domain. It's actually quite quite interesting interface that we have. That's just recently we just finished this, but I have a lot. More. I don't have a lot more detail on this in this talk. So another one, another interesting sort of model, actually. Once you have this cluster, once you have found clusters, you can build lots of models, right? And models are gonna be like really helpful in deriving like do predictive analysis and things like this. You can do mixture models, you can we have done logic models, we have done hidden markup models, we've done regression models, SVM models, we've done lots of models. Once you have this kind of stuff, you can start defining those models, right? And then once you have the models, you can, you know, you can do lots of things, analysis on this. So correlation is another thing, right? Where how you wanna maybe want to know like how variables are correlated. Also, how what they're related are. So, correlation is a strong indicator, right? It finds, like, you know, there's there's no correlation here, and then there's some correlation in both axes and so on. So, you know, correlations. And usually, what you use is like Pearson's correlation. You take the, you know, the covariance of two, uh, Pearson's correlation is like pairwise, right? Like two variables x and y, compute the correlation of that by just, you know, take the covariance divided by the standard individual variances. And then, or you can use sample correlations, just basically discretize now. And the way you do this, usually, you know, visualize it is like in this matrix, okay? It looks like this matrix of correlations, like here's like two, four, six, seven variables. Actually, there's more, I just obstructed a few. And these are the pairwise correlations here, and then you can just put in a matrix and, and, and colorize the, the cells in different colors depending on what the value of the correlation was. It's okay, you know, you can see some things here, but it's not, not overly intuitive, you want, we want to see like individual variables and want to get a quick view of variables, like a, all the variables you have, in terms of how they overall correlate. Right here, this is more like sort of clustering in a correlation domain. You can be all of the cells and get some for small, you can do this for small, for network, for the social network analysis and so on. So we came up with something else. We did, um, we put all the variables in a, in a, in a, on a 2D canvas and connect them by springs. This is actually a standard algorithm, like it's forced directly layout. You put them, these are like one variable, this is another variable, and so on. Connect all these with springs, and then it's stabilized. 
And then at the end, you will find get things like this. You get like each variable layout on a 2D map. And when variables are closer together, then they're more correlated. When they're spread, spread further apart, they're less correlated. Okay, you can see here, here is not correlated at all to any other attributes of the car. Okay, then it's when the, the link is green, then it's positive correlated. When it's red, it's negatively correlated. And then if it's deeper green, it's more correlated. And less green, it's less correlated. Okay, so you should get the idea. So here you can see horsepower and cylinders are very positively correlated. If you have more horsepower, you need more cylinders. More horsepower also means higher weight, and then less mile per and stuff like this. You can quickly see this, okay? Uh, so this is for a car. I'll show you like some, some a video on this, how this actually how this actually goes. This can also be used for lots of, of for high and high number of variables because it is we use multi-scale screws only for this. So I'll show you with an example. So this is artificial data set really. So we combine this with the parallel display. So this is going to be laid out. So now the now the variables are laid out using this smart force force directed layout. And you can sort of see certain populations of variables now. Here's like a certain population of variables. They all seem to be somehow related, but not very related to those guys here, not, not very much. And these are sort of outliers. Those variables are not related to anything at all, right? So now, and you can also, not yet, but soon, we all of the PowerPoint display. Oh, yeah. So, so now we can build a traveling salesman path, a path that maximizes the sum of collisions among all the different variables. Okay, this is like a path. Okay, this is like how a salesman would visit a, pub, a bunch of customers and optimize the, the, the time. Okay, so it's like a, then you can reorder the parallel photo display that I showed you before using this path. So all the all the different variables that are like are, are ordered along this path will also be ordered correctly here. And before it was like a total mess, but now you can really see like. There's some dependencies here, there's some other dependencies here, and this is like just noise, because they're not really correlated very much, right here. Like this is a very nice cluster, right? You can really see there's like three different trends going on, right? There's like here a trend and here another trend and a third trend. Okay, so you can really quickly see this. Oh. So it's like trend one. There's like basically three subspaces, three different different things that are going on. And then you can zoom in. And reduce the complexity of the power core display. You can zoom out again. And bring them. So it's totally interactive, it's real time. And you can also, as you zoom out, you can basically abstract lots of variables into a single variable. Okay, that also helps with like managing if you have hundreds or thousands of dimensions, it goes very, very nicely with this. And we can also control this if you like. Okay. So so that's the correlation display. So we did some analysis, you know, to sort of, you know, for demonstration purposes for, for, for university data, which really shows the power of the correlation display very nicely. So we took two data sets, US News data set, which, which ranks, the, ranks certain universities, actually all university college browser, which looks more at the social, at the social aspects of a campus. Okay, and we took these two data sets and combined them. Actually, it's always good if you fuse two data sets or more, you always get very interesting findings. If you have only one single data set, it's not that good. But if you have, once you have a lot of them, it's very nice. So we came up with this thing here. So it's the correlation plot I showed you, right? So here, we found, first we found out this is the academic cluster of variables, and this is the, this is the more the social environment cluster. Here you can see PhD and faculty, tuition, academic ranking, score. And, and, and here's athletics, income of the people that live there, population that lives in the town of the college, housing, location, nightlife. So you can see like there's certain, they're sort of grouped in, in aspects. And what's interesting here, the athletics actually sort of links those two things together, which is often the case, right? I went to Ohio State, football team is just an amazing link to, this, to the population, right? Everyone is crazy in fall that, that you know, Ohio State, you know, they, they, Everyone has the Ohio State band. Everyone wants to the university and wants to see the, the game, right? So, uh, so, but you can also see here, for example, it's interesting. Here's academic score and athletic. Athletics actually inversely correlated. This tells you a lot of this tells you a lot of stories. In one picture, you can you can tell a lot of stories, right? It seems like because you know that's why Harvard doesn't have a good football team because the academic score is very high, but they don't really have a good football team, right? So Ohio State. Okay, Ohio State is an outlier. <laughs> 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 
But, so, you know, and a lot of things, it's interesting, athletic and income, and usually the income of the place is low, then the athletic team is very high. You know, I guess, I don't know why that is, you know, have to keep people happy in some sort. And, and, and here, academic and PhD for faculty is also very interesting that, you know, when the academic score is high, then usually the faculty have more PhDs. You know, that's the price to pay. If you go to a good college, then you have to split your time with the, your advisor, right? Because everyone wants to work with this famous person, right? So you don't get a lot of time out of this person. You know, so now we can tell if you're famous or not. If you have no time for your graduate student, you must be, you must be famous. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some other things here. Location, nightlife, very hard, very, very, you know, of course, if a, if a good location, then the nightlife is higher. Population peak, then also these things are bigger. What's also nice, the size of the vertex tells you that we sampled a very wide range of populations. So we have a really good general data set, right? We really looked at all different types of schools in small cities, big schools, and, and, and big cities, right? Because this stuff, the bigger the vertex, the more the variation within the variable is. This tells you a lot, this thing, okay? It's just a nice tool. What we took next from this, we computed a causal model, okay? So causality, of course, is a very, sort of controversial topic, okay? And I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm aware, very aware of this. Correlation is not really causation. But there is not nice algorithms in there that can sort of suggest that there's some causal relationships and, and suggest there is probably not. But they usually have to be tuned by, by, by experts, okay? We, we found some crazy causations that really are not causations at all. We have a very nice algorithm that we use for this. So we found visualization really helps a lot, okay? When you look at these promoted causations, but then say, well, it's not really true. There really isn't a causation here, for example, because cylinders causes horsepower. Cylinders also causes weight. You know, horsepower causes millpower per gallon. I guess these are good causal relationships, but there's other things. There was like one with year. The horsepower doesn't cause the year, right? So there's like some things that are controversial, and then the user can just go in and maybe flip, flip a causation, then and run the algorithm again and, and make sure that everything else is consistent. You know, by, by you putting the user into the causation algorithm, you can actually gain a lot. Because you can actually overcome these problems that people have and always have that correlation is not causation. If you give the user some way to in interpret this thing and, and do some changes and make it really plausible, then you can actually you can actually start saying correlation is causation if the user is involved. Okay. This is just ongoing work here. So I want to give you like a little bit of a background in this. How, we, how I actually got, I, did I get into this? You saw my CV, right? Radiology, biomedical engineering, you know, I'm not a really a data analytics guy, at least I wasn't in 2001. But I, had a, I did have a, a point of with Brookhaven National Lab. And, and, and I, came, I came across these two scientists here. They were very adventurous, actually. In 2001, they already had big data, right? They had like high dimensional data, big data, and their names were um, Anna Zelenyuk and Dan Imre. I don't know if some of you know them. Uh, they're now Pacific Northwest, okay, we should have here. So, so these, these two, they built this uh, um, called single particle ablation uh, spectrometer. This is actually the SPLAT2 now, uh, SPLAT, which basically, what it does, it, 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 you mount, you go on airplanes and mount the sensor here, and it sucks in the particles from the environment and, and, and basically blasts it apart and, and look at the, and look at the mass spectrum, spectrogram. And this mass spectrogram is 450 dimensions, okay? And those data are extremely noisy because sometimes the particles are not fully blasted apart and then stuff like this, you know? But they seem to know very well how to work this stuff out, okay? But they have like, you know, oftentimes they need, they need to use a loop to really figure out where the populations of the particles really are, okay? And, and they also measure things like alongside with these concentrations and distributions of size, shapes, and then, of course, they measure the atmospheric temperature when they fly through the area and the, and the cloud density and stuff like this. And they have basically lots of data and, and, and high dimensions, and they want to, you know, want to get put the user in the loop to look at this. So they, they just, I just ran into them, basically, and, and, and was very interested in this and started working with this. And, and uh, basically what they want to do is understand the process that controls the atmospheric aerosol life cycle. Of course, this is probably some of the goals that you have to find the origin of climate change. Of course, everyone wants to know that. And uncover model of relationships between atmospheric aerosols and the climate. So basically, they want to, they want to figure out you know, what, the, what role do the aerosols play in the, in the formation of the climate change. And they fly around on the North Pole and the South Pole and uh, with these planes. And uh, 
So the Splat 2 now is the, is the next generation of the Splat 1 machine. Okay, it can now do 100 particles per second, and it pretty much can identify 50 to 3,000 nanometer or position of one nanometer. And this is for 50D mass spectrum that I showed you about, and it, it can really acquire billions of particles in the flight, right? So it's really just a massive amount of stuff we can bring out. And you have to first deal with decimation, so we wrote them an algorithm that can decimate the data a little bit. We have a cloud computing framework that, that does redundancy clustering within a small within a small sigma. It'll just only replace like one part, uh, many particles by one. Runs in the cloud on for multiple GPUs and actually finishes a job that used to take like days and like in a few hours, which is very nice to learn. Okay, so so when we started out, we both, we wrote to them we wrote them a two data analysis subsystem. One is called Cluster Sculptor which tries to sculpt the clusters, and the other one is spectra minor that tries to show, like, mine the spectra. Okay, I'm very descriptive, and I'm going to choose these names. And, and so basically, it tries to build a, build a hierarchy of the particles. There could be, like, you know, anorganics and organics. I'm not a real expert in this. If I, if I say any more of this, you will hate me. So I'm not <laughs> going to say anything more. So, so you know, so it basically builds a hierarchy of these, of these particle classes. In the end, there's, like, four or five main classes. Okay, and uh, so I want to show you this tool set. Okay, so here's the spectrum map. Here, each line, this is like early beginning, so this is like 2003. Okay, and we published this in, in, a, in a visual set. They also used it and published it in their own spectrum, in their aerosol science uh, mag uh, uh, journals. So, so here, each line is like basically a particle. This is 250D, 450 uh, uh, bins here. And you can sort of start seeing clusters here. There's like this cluster that has a lot here, and there's this cluster that has a lot here, and then there's this cluster here. This was like, and here's the, the hierarchy. Okay, it's like the different different nodes. Okay, so there's like a, the, the root node, and then there's like three sub nodes and so on. This is like that. But so we start building, subdividing these lines back to these line array into smaller, smaller, smaller pieces, and then and you can you can play around with the importance of the different spectra bits. So I. Some one time I proposed to Allah like maybe we should do something else, and she said, "Oh, don't throw away this particle bin. This is very important. Or particle bin forty three. I don't know, but she she said that. So it was a very interesting relationship we have with these scientists. And uh, so there's all these tools that they to control which variable you can merge and which one not, and then what is the standard deviations of each of these. So you know, so that's basically what we use. And then in the end, you come up with this sort of ident radio dendrogram. That's, these are the individual, this is after, after data decimation, and these are the different groups, clusters we find, and then they merge into other clusters by shrinking the, the sensitivity, and, uh, and basically become then classes. It's like all the particles in one in single nodes, and it's like a sub, sub nodes. And this really, this, this dendrogram really means something to, to those scientists, right? They really, they notice, you know, they can draw it out of their brains, okay? And we, you know, they really about it's the ordering, everything, the look of the stenogram is like almost like a, when you talk to a doctor, like a lung scan. They can figure out when there's a tumor in a lung scan right, very quickly. They can quickly see if there's a little more red or a little more green there, they know exactly what it means. And, and so basically what happens there, when it's a little, these are different classes, and when it's more, more, more bright, and there's more particles in this, in this class, and there's less bright, there's less particles in this class. And, and so on. This is like the different sensitive to pressure of the highest or low sensitivity, it was very sensitive, and then it gets merged and sensitive to special gets down. So this is called the standard And then this was our first attempt to do a little bit of clustering in n dimensions. So here we just did 3D. We use support vector machines to, to sort of create models that, that could classify particles that are on, a, on one cluster or classify particles in another cluster. So you could run this in an airplane, but you can actually go out and suck in particles and immediately see where these particles come from, what kind of, what type of of cluster day, what kind of uh, uh, class they come from. So, you know, this was like a first attempt to design a model of, of these, uh, you know, of the data space. So we then, we did, we did some more stuff. Actually, we published a paper, interesting paper recently on this, and I'll show you what it means. So what we, what we did was, we introduced power coordinates to them. We haven't introduced the TripAdvisor ND uh, uh, framework yet, and we are addition to the tools that we have. Then we let them see the correlation map. Okay. 
Did you tell me what one? Okay, that's fine. Maybe my maybe some my cell phone got it. Okay. So correlation map, we let them see the correlation map. We show them a Google Earth plugin because they really go, they fly around in, in the atmosphere, right? They wanna they wanna see where these particles come from in terms of geospatial coordinates. So we have a Google Earth plug, uh, Google Earth play, uh, plugin, and we, we link them all together with the information display. Google Google Earth plugin. You can basically brush around in the information display and then see what it looks like in the in the Google Earth where this particle actually came from. So I'll show you all this now. Okay, so. What we learned from them, you know, pie charts and histograms, they love this stuff, right? So this is really, you know, they want to see things in pie charts. And they used to go in a Google, in a, in a map, and display on each point in the, on the map, what is the particle, uh, uh, how many particles of, like, the, basically the particle uh, uh, configurations, like how many particles of this type, how many particles of this side make a pie chart or histogram. And they do this by hand, and they say, can you please make something that automates this so we can basically can focus more on our science and don't have to spend days and days in drawing things and analyzing things and, and making these pie charts with Excel, right? So we did this for them. So now you can basically mark something on Google Earth, and then it immediately creates, finds the particles that were, that, were, that were sensed in this area, and then creates these pie charts with different classes. So you have different types of things. So this stuff is just a regular pie chart, then you have your histogram of the mass densities. Here's another histogram more in, in line more around it. Okay, these are just different visualization techniques that we have, that we thought about. And uh, then we, we link the power coordinate display with it. So now you can start like you can start, oh you show me only the particles that I got this month for at this depth for this temperature. And you can also see now the correlations of the different uh, attributes in this, in this graph. So when it's like shaded like this, the gray shade, it's not so heavily correlated. If it's darker shade, it's more correlated. And if it's like this, if it's like it has this bow tie here, it's negative correlated. It's like a it's sort of a fundamental thing in power component. When, the, when, the, when, the, when there's a crossover like this, there's usually a negative correlation. It's just a set of standard signature. Okay, and you just abstract this with our illustrative display. So so now we have the data that are acquired in 3D. This is actually a different data set. So let's say there's like you know data you obtain on the ocean. And I think there's a name for this. I'll tell you in a second. Uh, uh, so anyway, here's like different measurement sites on the globe. Okay, this is a Google Earth. And then and then we, we, we draw these pie charts on top of this. Actually, this, those that actually don't have anything to do with one part. So this one data set is another data set. As you can see here, the flight path, right? So the flight path was like descending, it went above and descended slowly down, and, or did it go? I think it went up like this, and sort of a spiral went up, and collected particles as it went through the spiral, okay? So here, you can sort of go and, 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 and choose a certain area on the flight path, collect the particles that fall in it, and then make this pie chart. So it's very interesting display, like you can see these pie charts in the backdrop of, a, of, a, of, a, of the ocean. So, so the way it works is here, so we want to support the call to display, so you can, you can see the sites you collected here, and you can see the information here. And then you select a certain area here, like let's say you are interested in here, you're only interested in this particular location, want to compare with another location. So you can just draw right on Google Earth, you can just mark a polygon like this. And then it will show you only those particles that <coughs> really existed in this, in this polygonal area, right? So here's the red, red area here, there's the green area, you can start comparing things. And you can abstract a little bit, you can see like how, how correlations were and stuff like this. You know, so it's very, it's, it's not rocket science, it's definitely not something computer science is like, has major, major breakthroughs, but it's very, it's a very nice tool that they really appreciate a lot, okay? Which, which, which is readily available because you can use a Google Earth plugin, it just plugs right into your information visualization interface, you can do this and link them together with a little bit of socket programming and you can get this. Okay, so here's like one data set, you probably are familiar with this, it's the global seawater oxygen 8 to 18 data set, we got this from, um, ah, I forget it, I forget what we got this from. Um, so there's 26,000 seawater measurements from all around the world, eight variables, longitude, latitude, month, field depth, temperature, salinity, oxygen composition ratio. And, and apparently, for reasons I'm not familiar with, uh, so the, the, this, this, this oxygen composition ratio is a good trace of water origin, okay? And, and it varies regionally and seasonally under some specific conditions. 
And so it turns out when salinity is nearly zero of PSU, then, the, then this oxygen composition ratio is usually very, very wide. Okay, that's what people found out. Okay, there could be different reasons for this. So, so what we did was here, we, we basically can go now, if you want to test this, you can take your power corner display from all these different sites that you obtained these different variables and just bring down salinity to a small ratio and then see what happens. And indeed, this thing really varies widely. Okay, then you can examine different populations and see where they come from. Okay, so here, here's like this, this is what we did. Okay, so if you found out that in certain areas of the Gulf, like this is the Gulf population, this is the, this is the, 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 the St. Lawrence River here, river here, you can see the sites were always on the mouth of the river, always when the salt water meets the, the fresh water. Okay, that's where these sort of behaviors happen. When the salinity is pretty, pretty low, and this, this, this uh, oxygen composition ratio is high. Or varies. Okay, you can just see that quickly, right? Just by interacting, things get different. So I think it's an interesting tool. Okay, there's certain findings that you can find. Here's another one. This 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 data set that Allah Salim Yuk and Danny Emery collected. So it's from this a campaign ISDAC indirect and semi-direct aerosol campaign that happened in uh, in 2008. They flew uh, they flew in Alaska and had this path. You know, you can see this path. So the path was like a month-long field campaign that began in Barrow, Alaska, and ended in Fairbanks, Alaska, and then Shaw Transit went to the ground site, and he did like over 90 minutes, did like sample the cloud at low altitude, and then spiraled up to 7,000 meters. Okay, and then proceeded to Fairbanks, you can see this here. So it's very cool when you can look at Google Earth, and you can see like this whole flight path at different angles, you can go see what's going on, it's, it's, it's very nice. You know, it's interactive too, okay. So, so as I showed you before, so here are like these pie charts that we generate, and then here are the variables you can collect. You can, you can select the variables that you like to see, and then you can exclude the other variables that you don't like to see. You can, you can make some histograms and things like this, like this whole interface that, that works. And it's connected to information display, so you can start like identifying certain areas and, and, and see the signatures that the data are right in that area, okay? And then, okay more I can do analysis. So I want to give you some demonstration here. In this video, we provide a demonstration of our interactive visual analytics framework for exploring geospatial data with linked multivariate information displays. We start by exploring the data set of oxygen concentration in seawater. The system features a parallel borders plot of the data shown on the left and an interactive 3D geospatial view shown on the right, which we generate using the Google Earth API. Here the analyst is browsing the data set and interrogating a few data points individually. The points are highlighted in the linked parallel coordinate view as he clicks on them in the geospatial view. Next, the analyst uses the brushing tool in the parallel coordinates plot to filter out certain data points and view only those he is interested in exploring further. The geospatial visualization is updated accordingly. The analyst has just switched to our innovative correlation viewer. Here, a correlation is visualized as either a quadrilateral or a bow tie, depending on whether it's a positive or a negative correlation, respectively. The user has just filtered the data using our automated brushing tool show only those values which lie within a few standard deviation of meaningless along each axis. The ranges of only dimensions change as it increases or decreases the number of standard deviations he wishes to visualize. Now we explore the indirect and semi-direct aerosol campaign data set, which was obtained from aircraft flying over the north slope of Alaska in the United States in 2008. The user performs some brushing over the data set to begin the visual analysis. Note that a tool tip appears to assist the analyst in performing accurate brushing. Our framework enables the analyst to view details at individual sampling points using a unique set of glyphs we have designed. For example, here we see the use of a pie chart to show particle compositions at a particular sampling location. An embedded histogram shows another view of the data. Variable 
very small numbers of words can be tuned to a content, such as the number of bins in the siblings. Note that the geospatial view is linked to a histogram view up in the middle of the viewport. Clicking on the histogram on the right will also affect the change in the viewport on the left. We can also dynamically scale the glyphs as a function of a particular attribute, which we're usually doing now for the n slot attribute. Now we will explore a case study from the last day Aerosol data set, which was conducted in close collaboration with climate scientists. First, we follow the flight path that the aircraft actually took as it sampled the particulates in the atmosphere. On the geospatial display, we can use a series of mouse clicks to draw a selection region around sample points that are of particular interest. The points inside that region are then aggregated and shown as a single glyph that summarizes the enclosed data values. We find that the glyphs show significant spatial variability in particle compositions and sizes, which is consistent with the previous report of a highly stratified atmosphere. Most of the particles are biomass burning particles that were transported over both distances, during which time they absorbed sulfates and additional organic substances. Now the analyst is going to study the particles that are between the cloud droplets. He does this by clustering them randomly and then rendering them in red. Then he selects only the cloud droplets themselves and puts them into a separate cluster, which is shown in green. We find that the two pot charts are virtually identical, meaning that the particle compositions at the two locations are very similar. This was a significant scientific discovery. At a certain point in the flight, the aircraft descended to 7,000 feet along a spiral trajectory. This can be seen in the 3D space geospatial view on the right. Now we see as the analyst explores the samples taken during the ascent. The books reveal that the particle compositions change significantly in altitude, and furthermore that the changes are not monotonic. This also was a scientifically important discovery. So this all really much is all available in this, this software package that we wrote. The uh, sort of how columns are there, the network display that does the correlation plot. The spreadsheet, of course, to input your data. We can also do some mathematics on the data that, that you can bring back into the visualization algorithm. Like let's say you want to do like aggregation or you want to do a transformation or something like this. You can all do this and you know bring it back into the column display. You know, this also nice way to do this. Here the, the dynamic scatter plot is here that I showed you before to see like clusters. And then the <coughs> site map and this geospatial display is also there. They're all linked together, so you can you can start like finding clusters here and immediately see them here, and then also see them on the, if they have a spatial reference, you can see them here. So all of the stuff is somewhat interconnected. These are some the, these are some rather the latest publications that we wrote on this. You can all get this off on my webpage here. The faculty that uh, used the, the Kevin McDonald is the one that narrated the video at the Darwin College. Long term, so long term, a collaborator of mine, Alice Lenny, Dan Imre, and Yarna Lou from BNL, and whose work is on this work with some lots of PhD students that I had and graduated over the years. And uh, so, if you want to see papers and more information about this, you can go to my web page. Uh, so, anyway, if you have questions, let me know. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Same right shirt. Time. It's you wear the same shirt for the picture, right? It's a different shirt. No. Different color. <laughs> I just <laughs> like red, but it's different. <laughs> this has a this has a spot behind it. It doesn't. This one doesn't. <laughs> no, it's a different. Shirt. Let us see if there are any other questions. <laughs> but here's the power call. Uh, yes, John. Hey, Klaus, a lot of the data sets you are using as examples are very clean. Um, what do you do with uncertainty? Like, if you're making measurements, like the mass spectral data sets, for example, some of those dimensions are going to have really big errors uh, or uncertainties in the actual observations. How do you how do you deal with propagation of those errors or in in, in visually 
or, or are you assuming that the data sets are just, do they have to be super clean? No, no, the, the, the ones from the, from, from the aerosol campaign, they're not clean at all. Right, so how do you deal with the uncertainty how, associated with uh, measurements? I don't think these, these they do. Well, they, they does look clean to you, really. I mean, it's sort of fun. You can, you can, we have outlier detection programs. You can, like, you don't need to detect outliers. You can do clustering, you know, how do we get, and then it's just, remember the, 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 the dynamic display that I yeah. showed you, where two clusters were sort of, they always spread apart in a certain, in a certain, in a certain uh, uh, constellation. Why? And you can also, you can also edit things visually, like we, I didn't show you this, but you can go take the mouse and erase a few data points that you think are noise and then clean up. You can deactivate certain data points that say, okay, like you can brush them and say, okay, put them away, make them like, make them disappear for now, and you can bring them back if you like. Yeah. And, and you can see the other data set, the other, the other data that may be occluded by that. Yeah. So we have editing, we have, um, this, this brushing utility, um, outlet detection programs, and then you know, clustering, all, all kinds of clustering algorithms. Yeah. Subspace, I think subspace analysis is actually a really big thing, right? They can really look at certain, er certain parts of the data set. When you think about data sets, the way, at least the way I think about it, is there's really lots of things going on that may not be related at all, you just capture them all together, right? It's like, you know, there's like many people in this room, but when you go out of this room, you may have different lives, right? It's just like these, these data sets, you know, there's certain things that are not related, that just happen to be in one, in one cube, it's a hypercube now, right? So, yeah, so the beautiful thing here is that you can, you can look at the noise, right? And, and, and eliminate it and say, what is really noise? What is really true? You know? Yeah, right. That it, you can actually visualize it and then have some tools that help you to, you know, you can bring these, to, you can bring things together. You can erase it. You can you can classify it as noise. And then, oh, another thing what I want to tell you about, which I also didn't show, is we have something called projection pursuit, which is also a mathematical procedure. That you say, I want you, you say I want a certain criteria. For example, I generate some a set of randomized projections onto the data set, and I say, okay, for each of these randomized projections, please optimize the view based on certain criteria. I can say, okay, please make it spread out two populations very widely, or give me a big range of things, or give me more outliers. You can just formulate that in, a, in a, like an in interface. You can say, please give me the, the view that gives me the, gives me the best look at the data given this criteria. And that actually helps a lot, because you're gonna end up searching a long time for things if you do it by hand. If you have a little bit of assistance, then that's fine. And you can configure it. You can say, please don't, you, for example, you have a little interface that says, do not, do not, do not optimize the view by removing this attribute from the view. Right? I always keep that at high, at a high prominence. Okay? Then it'll, it'll just keep that, and 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 and, and optimize for other purposes. Okay? So it's it's called projection pursuit. We have a it's optimization algorithm. Right, I've got two questions. Then so short one is this assumes stationarity in the data, right? When you oh, you mean not time varying? Yeah, it's, it's no time variance. It's, well, time is, we use time as a, as a, as a, as a dimension. Yeah. It's yeah. another dimension. The time can be another dimension. The time we have in there. So okay. for, when you okay. compute correlations. When you are computing the correlations, so you're then you're right. assuming stationarity. The, the, yeah, but there, the, for now, but also causality, yeah, we, we assume, but you can put time into this. And you can come up with feedback, feedback control service. Okay, the second question is on the college data example. Yeah, what, what intrigued me was I didn't see any connection between athletics there and the safety and other variables which I expected. Is it because they were switched off? So, safety. Oh, we, we, we thresholded, I think. Say what? We, we thresholded it a little okay. bit. So we did, so not, like we correlations, we basically thresholded away. You can set that, right? You can say, oh, you showed me everything about 0.3, something like that. Yeah. That'll, re that'll remove some of the weak links, make it easier to read. Okay. But this is what we found, was the safety, yeah, it doesn't seem to be highly correlated. 
Dann ist das Wort gebaut. Dann ist es der Widersacher. Well, you think that you would be related to income and uh, things like that. You think that, right? Apparently, it's not true. <laughs> it's, 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 it has something to do with nightlife and transportation. You know, when things have good transportation system, usually the safety is better, right? And there's more buses, right? People. I mean, it, it shows you, right? Safety is not related to, to academic, you know, so you can have. I mean, I, was in, I spent a lot of time in Cleveland, Cleveland Clinic. It's funny like how these really good schools are usually the worst neighborhoods. It's very interesting. The Cleveland Clinic is like this massive like project, project uh, area. Like it's, it's an oftentimes like the Georgia Tech, I think. Yeah. Huh? you. Yeah. Yes, so is the API simple enough for people to input the spreadsheet or you need a spatial program. Oh it's actually it's actually not an API, it's actually a, it's a it's a package. Okay. It's not an API. I mean we don't we haven't really created a, a library or API okay. but you can now you yes exactly that's what actually Yang Gang Wu from BNL also said he would like to have an API. We, I think we did some a little bit of work towards that. That people can call it from MATLAB and things like this. So far, it's not really an API. So, if somebody has the spreadsheet right. of data, can they use this? They software? can bring it in, yes. yes. Uh, the spreadsheet is the correct, the, the comma separate file is the correct. So, the they can do this themselves, or they need to ask your group? No, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I have other things to do. <laughs> I don't so, have a help desk. So, <laughs> they can download the software and. Uh, sure. It's from, it's actually ndscope.net. Okay. I think I have this one. Yeah, you're welcome. It's, it's, but I have to tell you, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's just saying, it's gradual, okay? It's not like, you know, don't expect like amazing, you know, beautiful software that always runs, right? It won't crash. Because it's written by, by graduate students, you know, that they're not putting them down, I'm just saying, you know, this, everyone, every, when you develop software, you always keep avoiding the problematic areas intuitively. I don't know how this, have worked in, same thing when I write, you know, when I wrote software too, I mean, I would always never hit that button because I sort of knew it was, would not do well. <laughs> but when another user doesn't notice, then it, you know, so it's, it's a little buggy, but it's, it's what it is. Sure. I have a, a broader question. Um, so you showed us the lot of really complex data sets that are Well, that's a good question. Um, so, yes, I mean, this is like a question about the visualization fields doing in terms of visualization. So, I, I think we're pretty unique when it comes to this dynamic scatter plot. There's only one software package called Gobi, GGOBI, which they do a little bit, this runs mostly in R, in, this, in, in the statistical software R that you probably all know. There's GGOBI, but they, 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 they're not, see, I think what I bring in is more user interfaces because I'm more of a user interface usability, human factors kind of person that, that try to, that try to you know, make things practical. While people from the statistical community, they, 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 may, not know the, they may not know all of these things. You know, they, may, they may not consider like making things more user friendly, okay? So the only other, comp the other, only other package that actually does dynamics kind of laws is g -Code. But they, 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 don't provide, they don't provide the linkage to correlation, for example, which we do. I don't think there's anyone who's doing a correlation for us. I have never seen this. And I, we just published this paper, the correlation paper. We got, <clears throat> this was like one of the few times where I got only minor revision. Okay, usually you have to do my major, but this just flew through the, to the journal. So, and then we have the causality paper will also, will, will also be written soon. And get more. So the correlation plot is definitely the only one. So linking those two together also, I've not seen this before. So the only thing that's really the dynamic scatter plots, G O B has some of them. And then the Pelicornet. Pelicornet, of course, is a very standard ubiquitous thing. Okay, Pel everyone has Pelicornets. So this, this interaction is not new. I don't want to like say that I did that. Okay, I just provide because it's powerful. But the illustrative part that only we did. So thanks for this question. It's good to say that. <laughs> so, are there no more questions? Uh, so let us thank Professor Brule for such a nice question.